And I says, my God, here's something that was started in 1953. And this was well before the big push into Vermont for a lot of ski areas uh, such as Mount Snow and um, Bromley, Killington. Pico was there from, I think, in the early, the late 40s. They had their Comstat bar. And uh, I started realizing, I said, what's going on here? And I found out from discussion with Dr. Lane why the ski area closed, because it had so much promise. You're sitting on a 10-mile uh, wide ridge, and if it had opened up, you would have seen an incredible ski area. Inside the line, the Catskills. This episode is brought to you by Scenic Route Guiding. If you're ready to hit the trails, make sure you take the scenic route. Our guides are here to help you with your goals, big or small. Check out the Scenic Route Guiding and Gear Rentals on Instagram and Facebook for more information. Also, if you mention the podcast, you can get 10% off. Use the code Mountain Lion. Mountain Lion. Mountain Lion. Hey guys, thanks once again for listening. So I had to cut this episode into two different pieces because there was so much information and time that I spent with this guy named Russ who knows a story about Bear Pen Mountain, which used to be a ski center called the Princeton Ski Bowl. It's a very interesting story, very long, interesting story. So if you haven't already, check out the Bear Pen story online by Russ LaChapelle. I'm going to say Russ L. Hopefully I got it right. Um, he does a fantastic outline of the whole Bear Pen Mountain story about the Princeton Ski Bowl. Uh, I'm going to post something on Instagram, Facebook, and probably Twitter about it. So make sure you definitely go and check that out before you listen to this because it's going to make everything easier to understand. Uh, Russ goes all over the place with the information because he has so much information about this story. So without further ado, part one of Bear Pen Mountain, a.k.a. the Princeton Ski Bowl enjoy welcome everyone to episode 26 of inside the line the cat skills i have a special guest here with me tonight um his name is russ and he did a huge story on bear pen mountain if you don't know the story on bear pen mountain i will post links in the show notes bear pen mountain used to be a ski resort and it was going to be an amazing ski resort so we're going to talk about that tonight i'd like to thank our sponsor scenic rock guiding I'd also like to thank monthly subscribers, Katrina Weinig, Darren White, John Comiskey, Vicky Ferreira, and Jim C. So, Russ, uh, question of the night, I ask everybody this. You having anything to drink tonight? <laughs> no, absolutely. Actually, I do. I have coffee, but anything strong, no. I, I'm not a participant in that area. Okay, excellent. I just ask everybody that, and sometimes they might give me a local beer or a local you know, whiskey, and I'll, I'll post it in the show notes to give them a little love. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So I don't usually put history on here, Russ, but this is going to be about history. This is going to be about great history. One of my favorite histories in the Catskills. I, I love this. I love reading your story. I can't wait for people to read your story on the internet and the website. I'll post, I'll post a couple of those because you, you, you've done a lot around New York state with, with the lost ski resorts, correct? Oh yeah. Yeah. I got, got involved in this is uh kind of a, a way to get away from one of my other uh, addictions which is uh collecting fight films boxing matches that i did for a good 20 years before this wow amazing amazing so let's get on to it my guest of the night is russ and we're going to talk about bear pen mountain who used to be an old ski resort and was going to be a huge ski resort it's changed the dynamics of skiing resorts on the east coast so russ how you doing tonight i'm uh, pretty good pretty good pretty good 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 um Hey, Russ, if you want to give just a little background about yourself, you know, um, your, your skiing days, your, your young days, where you live and stuff like that, go right ahead. Yeah, that would be kind of a good place to start because uh, I was pretty intrigued at a young age about skiing. I, I became familiar with skiing, strapping on a pair of skis that my neighbor had, and behind their house, we had a little hill. Generally, the hill was used for uh, flying saucers. And we would make runs 
with that and ice it up, throw water on it. And it was a lot of fun. It was a neighborhood gathering place during the wintertime. Uh, I grew up uh, in Liverpool, New York, which is outside of Syracuse. So we were always getting the lake effect. I always had plenty of snow when I was a kid. And uh, naturally developed, you know, you run up, to, up and down just a small hill. I wanted to go for something better. So January 1st of 1966, I went to my first ski area, which is Song Mountain. Uh, and it was a cold, cold day. I can still remember outside lacing up my boots. And at that time, there were cable bindings that I had attached to these old Fisher Red skis. They had uh, the, the blades on the bottom were screwed in. So it was, you know, just a, a cheap pair of skis to do some business with. And uh, that's where I finally first got on to, to really go and skiing. And uh, the way I would get to these ski areas would be through fathers. And I had a friend of mine who also skied. So he was my buddy. And what generally happened was my father would take us down and then my buddy's father would take us back. And that was only based upon um, hours of work, time for both of them. And uh, we skied uh, Song quite a few times because it's located directly off of Route 81. It's almost like a billboard on 81. You can't miss it as you're going south towards Cortland. Uh, also at the time, there was a place called Labrador, which was a little bit further, and we skied there. And there was also a place called Toggenberg, which is just a little bit beyond it, actually easier to get to than Labrador. And uh, that's where we, we basically, basically went. And at that point in time, um, all these skiers were fairly new. Um, Song had been built in 1963. Labrador was a little bit before that. But their basic modes of transportation up the hill were T-bars. And we always heard about these chairlifts, especially at Greek Peak, which was way, way far from my parents. I used to argue about, we want to ski the chairlifts, we want to ski the chairlifts. Said, well, we're not going way down there. <laughs> what's the difference? What's it, a T-bar will just pull you up by your hands, right? Yeah, you the bar would the lift attendant would put it between two people. You'd be standing next to each other, and the bar would go between you, and it would go uh, uh, below your rear end, and this it would you would just go up the, the mountain with your skis on the snow. Oh wow! That I I mean, a lot of these people that listen to this probably have never seen a T bar, so it's pretty it's pretty neat. So uh, continue. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, well, the T bar is still around, but at that point in time. Uh, because of Hall lifts being located centrally, actually, uh, Victor Hall started out of his house in South Syracuse and then uh, migrated up to Watertown. And, but, but the basic, the, the T-bar that he was building was almost over-engineered. It had a, a spring in the middle of it. And uh, because of the location, most of these ski areas all had Hall lifts. The, all the ones I've talked about so far had Hall. Um, Greek Peak was Hall, and they had one of the first chair lifts that Hall made. So uh, it's just uh, when you're on a T-bar all day long, you want to be able to sit down between runs. It was just, I guess as a kid, it was, uh, wow, this is cool. We could sit down and this nice. type of stuff. So um, eventually in 1966, um, just shortly after Christmas, a new scary in the area called Intermont was born. And what was fascinating about this place was it was built upside down. In other words, the lift and the parking lot were at the top of the mountain, and you would buy a lift ticket, and then you would ski down to the bottom, and then the trail would bring you up to the top. And that was within reason for our parents to take us to. So we went there shortly after it first opened up in 66, and but its official first real start of the season was in 67. Um, and what was interesting about this place is they had all-night skiing. Oh, so wow. we, 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 and in the, back in that day, it wasn't a big deal for parents to allow their children to do a few more things that they wouldn't normally let them do nowadays. You find that there's so many things to worry about, and parents want to be protective of their child. 
our parents basically, uh, you know, my father brought us down and my buddy's uh, father brought us back up. And, and it wasn't thought of that we were doing anything, that they were doing anything wrong. It was just something that, you know, we, we put it forth to them. Hey, we like to go skiing all night long. And, and it worked out well, you know. So, uh, but this place was so fascinating. And, and it had a chairlift. And so we, it had everything we wanted. And uh, that year before that, we had in that area what was called the blizzard of 66. Um, we woke up to, in February, um, six feet of snow in 15 hours. Wow. Holy crap. It, it, was, really, it was really something. So the ski area, Intermont was built with um, no snow making because they figured it was going to be. And what happened was the first two years of existence for snow uh, for Intermont, there was a thaw that lasted. And we didn't get any snow until after in uh, about the second, third week of February. So it really screwed up the, the situation. The first year uh, it happened, The I, I later on did an interview with the guy who created the place. And he told me he went to the owners and they said, no, nah, it's just a fluke. And then it happened again the next year. So they had two bad, bad years to get going. Uh, he finally quit. Another guy took over. They made, they, got, they put snow making and they put it what's called an air system. And it was a, a cheaper design than what you have, you see commonly now in some of the bigger skiers, which is the state of art nowadays. Uh, but uh, one of the attendants that was there all night long started drinking beer and fell asleep, and the <laughs> system froze up. So <laughs> that was the end of that. But this is where it all, it all got very intriguing uh, for me. And also during that period of time, I had gone to gas stations, and they used to have these maps where they had indications of all these ski areas. Some, some of the maps had some of the ski areas, others had others. So what I did was create my own map, and I had all these gears, almost close to 100 of them in New York. And wow. I also heard about all the skiing that was going on in Vermont, where there seemed to be more of a push than in New York. Although New York had a lot more than Vermont, Vermont had, it seemed like there was a more of an insurgence of money. And plus the mountains were bigger, which of course is a, long, a, a young kid, that intrigued me even more. And I rode away to a lot of these ski areas to get brochures of the ski area. So as it be, when I was 14, my father got transferred to the Albany area. And we moved here. And I started going, at that time, to high school. And they had a ski club, so I got involved in that. And we used to take buses up to all these places in Vermont and, and so forth. And also, um, we had a church youth group, and some of the people that were in church were acting as chaperones, and they brought us up to places like Gore and Whiteface and such forth to, to go skiing. So I really got, in my high school years, a real good push on really skiing a lot of different places, the big places. So they really kind of migrated into a, a wonderful situation. And um, Russ, uh, eventually, yes. Would you say that um, skiing was a lot bigger back in the 60s than it is now? I would say the newness of it all created wow. an ambiance for this type of situation, yes. I think okay. it's pulled back. I don't think skiing is, is uh, on an uphill climb. You know, yeah. Okay, I was just curious. Because it sounds like when, when you're when you're naming all these places, it's just like wow, it blows my mind. Yeah, well, it became very popular. It's, it's like anything that's new, you know, the availability of these mountains and stuff. They just started building them, you know. Uh, I mean, a lot of them were well in, in place. You had Stowe and Mad River Glen and Killington, Pico, and all these places up in Vermont. I mean, especially. Places like Stowe and Mad River, they were built back at the, uh, just before 1950. So um, they had a jump on just about everybody. And, and I think they were advertised, come to the ambiance of Vermont and 
it, it, it was just they, they made it look like uh like some big deal and it really at that time was a big deal you know mm-hmm. and of course Hampshire had their their fill and uh, of course New Hampshire in the southern part had smaller areas and then you got up into the Vermont the uh, White Mountains I'm sorry not Vermont but the White Mountains and there were big places like Cannon which had a tramway which nobody at that time had it was uh, it was its own draw and that's the way that went and and that started early I mean I think that I think that tramway was there in the 50s early 50s if not before wow and uh maine got skiing like at, at that point in time sugarloaf which is huge 2600 yeah. vertical now they they had a gun they put in a gondola but the rest of the list were all t-bars they had no chairless oh, wow so and eventually they went through a big problem because uh, it's so far up north that nobody wanted to drive all the miles to get to this fantastic place. And they ended up uh, going through a bankruptcy thing and somebody bought them out and the rest is history as to what it is now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So my passion at that point in time was to ski everything I could. that was over 2000 vertical. And I, I pursued that goal and achieved that goal. Um, I also skied every place in the Northeast. That would be Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, Connecticut, New Hampshire. I, I skied all the places. There, I mean, there's no big places in, say, Rhode Island or Connecticut, but it was a notch in my belt to be able to ski all the places in New England. But the big goal was achieved was all the places above 2,000 vertical. So that was how I spent my youth and into um, – the time period before I went to college. And of course, when I was in college, didn't have any money. And also during that time period, we had a gas shortage oh. or what they called a gas shortage. And a lot of the chairlifts and stuff were had at that time been running on gas and they had to do a switch over to electric and a lot of the places couldn't afford it. So that's when <laughs> you first saw a lot of the places just starting to, to fall apart. Oh, wow. Um, there was the one I can think of, Major League. There was a ski area called Petersburg Pass, which is right on the Massachusetts New York line. And um, it went dormant for a year or so. And another guy bought it out and cut all kinds of trails. And the weather, and between the wet, bad weather, there was a series of weekends where it would, it would start snowing, then turn to rain, and then freeze and rain. And, and, it just wiped out all their plans. I mean, they had that mountain, I think had an 800 vert vertical before he bought it and he was turning it into a, a 1600 foot vertical. Oh, wow. Crazy. So that being, if, if it had survived, that one would have changed the, you know, you, you probably wouldn't have had a strong Bromley or what at the time was Brody. Brody was a very, very popular area. It had intermediate skiing, night skiing, and it was very, very popular. It had a nice lodge, and they had a lot of things going. And uh, But those places definitely would have been hurt because they couldn't compete with a vertical that big, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's how my, you know, and then I, I started working. I mean, I, I'm a floor, flooring installer, and I, I, I went to... Just like most people, you know, we go to work and you start become responsible and mm-hmm. you, you, you try to you do what you have to do to survive. So skiing yep. uh, kind of went in the back, back burner for me, you know. I mean, I went out and skied a few times, but it was more important to, to live my life. I, I guess I was maturing. I guess that would be <laughs> the best way to do it. Yep. You know? Agreed. So, I, that's basically... Well, I got, you know, that that's the basic background of my interest like, in all this. Yeah. So you, you basically are just a big ski enthusiast. You know, you, you love pursuing the skis. Yeah, of course. I, mean, I, 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 I would study this stuff like I was going, it was going to be a math test or something, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had so much information and I didn't lose any of it. I, I, I had retained it and, and everything went along. And, uh, 
Then I ran into a guy with the internet came along who ran a website called Nelsap. It's New England Law Ski Areas. And he was in college up in Vermont to become a weatherman. And I called him up and I said, you know, I know a lot about all this history stuff because what he was doing was trying to find all these dead ski areas. You know, he mm-hmm. called them lost. I didn't particularly like that name connotation to it because he, they never really, lo- you don't lose them. They just stop operating, you know. Yep. But that, that's, that was his thing, and I was supposed to hook up with him on that. But he kind of went his own way as far as that went along. And I found a kid that had started uh, a small little website about New York skiing. I contacted him to help him out. And uh, I knew how to write HTML. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll create all this stuff for you, and then I'll give you all the connections. And that's where I basically started doing, taking all the research that I, I had already accumulated. And my goal was to go out and find out why all these ski areas died in New York. And uh, I was limiting myself just to New York. I didn't want to go into New England because I figured he had that undercover, you know. Yeah. And... Uh, and then it, it, I said, well, I really want to get the juice on this. So I tried to find the guys who built the places so I could find out what the real deal was. Wow. And, and through research with different people and going to these towns. And, and uh, I used to haul my uh, little Suzuki quad runner on the back of my car. And I would bring that to the ski areas and run around on the trails to see how they were set up. And then I would check with people in the town and said, do you know anybody who might be associated with this place when it was running? And I would eventually find the connections that I needed to. Wow. Amazing. Um, so uh, awesome. I mean, that's a, that's a hell of a, a background. You are like pursuing everything. So I guess our, our next, my, my next question is you put a, a phenomenal website about the story of Bear Pen Mountain. It is, it is very, well like well thought and well well descripted when did you start writing this story well i started that as an offspring i did not really put together bear pen although and i'm going to go back to my childhood in my local town of liverpool there was a place called the liverpool sports center and of course we as young kids used to go in there we couldn't afford anything but you went in there, in that time, you saw uh, a rack with all these head skis that had no bindings on it and, and heart skis, which were the, the two major manufacturers at that time. And we'd just go in there and start dreaming, you know, because uh, all I could afford was these little wood things. Mm-hmm. Eventually, I would, I eventually went to like a, a semi fiberglass slash wood ski with what was called Cubco bindings. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they had little plates that were screwed to your the, the, the toe piece and the heel of your boot, and you would slip them into this thing, into the, into the binding, and that was how you were. It was the second step beyond the cable binding. Mm, okay. And then, of course, then it went to step-ins like Solomon's and Look Nevada, those type of things. Yeah. But... It, the reason why I bring this up is because I did not know this at the time. One of the, the guys that ran Liverpool Ski Center was a big pusher on uh, the Bear Pen, uh, a.k.a. Princeton Ski Bowl, ski area. And when I finally went to find out about this story and through different people in, in and around the Prattsville, Roxbury, area in the Catskills, I was getting information, and I finally hooked up with the guy who created it, Dr. Ben Lane. And he, through conversation, talked of all kinds of things, and uh, he asked where I grew up, and I told him, he says, oh, the guy who ran the Liverpool Liverpool Sports Center used to be one of our uh, biggest supporters. And it was like kind of uh, an ironic situation that that here I have come not knowing about this. And I had remembered from my maps, Princeton Ski Bowl, 
But everybody that kept telling me said, did you find out? When I went to, to find the histories of some of these areas, these guys, because they were in the ski business, knew about bear pen. And they'd keep saying, do you know about bear pen yet? I go, no, no, no. But little did I know that I had all along known about the Princeton Ski Bowl, which is on Bear Pen Mountain. Okay? So once I got to Dr. Lane, I started I started realizing what was going on. I went before I met him to the mountain and I went from the bottom figuring, okay, they must have skied down to the bottom and I went started walking up through the woods and I would find all these stone walls. And they looked, they were untouched. And what had happened was the stone walls were created to, to mark off boundary lines and to keep the cows in. And uh, I said, these things haven't been touched. How did they come ski down through these things? And, of course, talking to Dr. Lane, I found out that they never really skied. There, were, there was a trail that went down all the way to the mountain, but it wasn't. Uh, Dr. Lane had been trying to purchase the bottom uh, property, but the deal went through. But they did allow for, at the end of the day, the trail that went down um, to the bottom of the land that he had on about the midway point of the mountain, connected to an open farmland, and then they could ski down at the end of the day to the base of the road. Mm-hmm. So that area did not have did not have the stone walls. So that's that's how I, that's how I found a little bit of tidbit about it, but. Looking at topographical maps and getting more information about the ski area, I started realizing what this place had and the time period that it was developed. And I said, my God, here's something that was started in 1953. And this was well before the big push into Vermont for a lot of ski areas, uh, such as Mount Snow and um, Bromley. Killington, Pico was there from, I think, in the early, late 40s. They had their Comstat bar. And uh, I started realizing, I said, what's going on here? And I found out from discussion with Dr. Lane why the ski area closed, because it had so much promise. You're sitting on a 10-mile uh, wide ridge, and... If it had opened up, you would have seen an incredible ski area, which had the jump on Killington. As you, if anybody who skied Killington or knows anything about it, it covers a vast area. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been there. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Bear Pen would have been well ahead of it. Wow. Um, they were in negotiation with a, a gentleman by the name of Gene Palmagowski. And that name is important because he was a lift manufacturer uh, who created the Palma lift, which was a common, it was a pole with a little like a six inch plate on the bottom and you would flip the bar between your legs and the pole would sit there. One person at a time would be brought up. So it it had the characteristics of a T-bar, but a single operation. Wow. at that point, see, Pomagowski was a detachable lift. In other words, when you went up to get on this lift, the, the attendant would have you um, put the, the lift between your legs and you would move back to like a, a little box. The back of your skis would hit the box and then you would wait. He would pull a, a lever and it would engage the, li- the, the lift that you're on onto the onto the cable. So it was a detachable lift. And that's why there was uh, talk about, at that time, uh, with Dr. Lane, the first detachable lift to be built, chairlift. Wow. Which would have, in that time period, they were talking 1958. You can imagine what that would be like. And, of course, Bear Pen is located in an area where you don't have to drive all the miles up into Vermont. And mm-hmm. that period of time, New York State Thruway had been just built. So the timing of everything would have been perfect. There was no Hunter Mountain at that time. There yeah. was no window. There was uh, Bel Air and High Mont, and that was about it. Yeah. 
like uh when did you like uh, like a specific date when did you start writing about the this story like when did you start gathering information well i was all the time talking with dr lane who uh is to this day he's a practicing uh eye doctor uh-huh. so he's got a busy practice so i would off and on generally some nights um weekends especially sundays gather a little information gather a little information I went down to his place and I found out that he had all kinds of pictures and information and this and that. And I asked him if I could take it up to my house and start scanning it. And uh, that's where a lot of the pictures came from that are on the website and in the story. And as I finally got to a point where I felt I could do this thing justice with the information I had in my head, I would, I started the story and I would say that would be, Oh God, that'd have to be about 1999. Oh, wow. And, uh, of course it get to certain points and then I have to juggle my words a little bit to, I didn't want to make it too lengthy, but I wanted it to be concise. Oh, it's, it's, it's not lengthy, trust me. It it is an incredible story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could have made it a lot, lot longer. I could have gotten into a lot more detail about how it went bad, which maybe I can discuss now because it's a uh, it's an intriguing effort in itself. Because it didn't the skiery didn't fail because it wasn't popular. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Mm. I mean, you can you can ask me to participate in that part of it whenever you want to. Um, I don't know what direction at this point you wanna you wanna go with this thing. Oh, we're gonna go as as far as you can. So um, so we're gonna there might be some other parts of this that might be important to you. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll take this a that we'll take that a little bit later, definitely. Um, so um, we're gonna I'm gonna go over the quick timeline of events basically of of bear pen mountain is that okay with you certainly okay so if i remember correctly from your story uh dr ben lane was skiing bel-air and he saw that bear pen mountain had a little bit had some more uh rhyme on it than any other catskill mountain high peak he pursued it 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 was very very white compared to any other place yep and the reason he came to know about this because he, after going back and checking the topography, see what he was involved in was an outing club and he became president of the outing club with support with, uh, from a gentleman by the name of Ralph Nader, who some people may know about. He was, he went, uh, for president and stuff like that. He yeah. wrote unsafe at any speed about the, um, Chevrolet Corvair. It didn't have the engine in the front. And mm-hmm. he was trying to get our outlaw because he thought it was very dangerous. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Dr. Lane uh, was trying, he got the idea that the, the club needed a place for them to ski. And he was looking all over the place. He, he, he looked for, for de- de- different mountains. Um, he came to be thinking that the Castles were the right place for a good reason. Logistically, it was in the right place for people up and down, up and down the, the the coast. And I'm talking New York City, uh, places in New Jersey, Philadelphia, even Washington D.C. Because at that time, the arterials had already the system for that, the Eisenhower um, interstate system had already started to to, to flourish. Um, the New York, Stewart, New York State Thruway wasn't quite in place at that time, but it was already on a map to be started. Yeah. And uh, so he was he was going around trying to find places in the Catskills. Uh, one of his favorite places was Blackhead Mountain. Yeah. Because uh, when he saw that, that, that developed uh, over 3,000 vertical in the Catskills. It was ridiculous, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Um, but it, it didn't have, it didn't collect snow like what he found to be with bear pen and anybody who looks at a topical graphic map of bear pen would see that it has on the west side of the mountain or actually kind of yeah i guess it'd be the west 
basically west. Um, it has these big scoops, and where Bear Pen sits, it's kind of similar to Plattic Hill, that it collects lake effect snow, and it also um, gets any coastal storms. So you can get bombarded by both things. But what's intriguing about it is the winds would come from the west, and it would blow the snow, it would blow up these, these curves and make the snow actually go up in the air and then deposit it on the north, northeast side of Bear Pen. The Bear, Bear Pen with a northeast kick exposure that it has is perfect for holding snow. So that's why he saw it to be so white all the time, because it, it was getting the best of all the worlds, you know. And yeah. of course, when he, w he went there and started looking at the mountain in reality, the setup for a skier is just perfect. I mean, yeah. uh, yeah. I came to know this place as utopia because in comparison to anything I had found before, there was nothing like Bear Pen. And because I had skied all these ski areas beforehand all over the place, it, it, it was just, I said, my God, I have found Nirvana, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, it, and I basically gave up doing anything with the website as far as these ski areas. And I had a lot of people that I contacted that I was going to write all these stories um, like I did for Bear Pen. Um, my first original story was with the Simps at the Simpson Slopes, which was the first real ski area in New York. Mm -hmm. They were the first one to have a rope tow. And uh, I interviewed, one, there were three brothers who ran the ski area. This is, you know, you're talking before World War II, they started this place. Oh, wow. And uh, New York State was involved with it. To supporting them and this is all before Bel Air was built and they they organized the ways to get these trains up from Kingston people were able to ride the trains up to Kingston from New York City they got another train go up and they would they would stay at, up there at Simpsons it's a little town of Phoenicia anybody who's been there knows there's not too much going on in Phoenicia yeah and uh, it's that's that was the first start, and New York New York State saw that their push at Simpsons had had a real effect, and they actually went to the point where they uh, went to uh, legislation to change the Forever Wild Casco Park so that they could build um, Bel Air because there's nothing you know part of the problem with Hunter that they can't expand. I mean, Hunter Mountain isn't really on Hunter Mountain. It's off to the side of it. Yeah. And anybody who's been there is taking a look at, at Hunter Mountain. And that was one of uh, Dr. Lane's choices, but he was up against the same thing. You know, it's forever wild and you can't, you can't build on here. Yep. And the same thing has happened for Hunter. And, but the Slavskis did build a big ski area there. I mean, it, it's for a private area. I think the, there's nothing that really comes close to competing with the size of the mountain that they did, maybe Wyndham, but Wyndham has a different feel to it than than Hunter does. Yeah, and that H came Hunter along. has more vertical on some certain sides. I think yeah, more fall line. It, yeah, it's you know if if you ski Wyndham, it it tends it, there are a few trails that at the very top are are really super steep, but after a while they have no flavor to them because they're straight up and down. You know, what I mean they don't have any curves really too there are trails that have that but they're gentle in comparison hunter has some real real interesting material to ski you know yeah so um and of course part of part of the the reason why hunter was built uh, by the slutskis uh in the early time 1957 dr lane commissioned the slutskis the uh, i and O construction company and they were road builders so i and all would be izzy and and uh horrible slutsky they were road builders so oh. they were up on bear building trails before hunter mountain oh. and their their father owned what was called it's really called colonel's chair that's what that that little extension that hunter was built on they they commissioned people they put advertisements to have find somebody who wanted to 
build a ski area yeah. and and operate it. And they ran into the, the younger Hamberstein son, and they went in with some money and they basically rent rented the mountain and the Slutskys built Hunter Mountain. And then uh, Mr. Hammerstein developed a slight drug problem and couldn't afford to pay the rent and everything. So Orville and Izzy took it over. And that's where history went. Now it's owned by Vale. And both mm-hmm. Izzy and Orville are dead. Yeah. So um, getting getting back to Bear Pen, a, a.k.a. Prince and Ski Bowl, um, you know, Dr. Ben Lane was, was a, a smart guy. And he chose bear pen for a reason it was because it caught the snow how did it i mean how did he notice that that it caught so much snow he pursued it for like a reason right well he he used to go with the outing club but they used to go ski bel-air and highmont matter of fact he became good friends with the davenports who ran highmont and they would allow they allowed him a key to get in there and the outing club used to stay overnight in the lodge at highmont Oh, nice! But from that from that location, they kept seeing uh, over time that mountain up ahead of them there that kept being white. And at the time, Ben was looking for the right mountain for the to develop a ski area for the outing club. That was that was his original intention. And uh, after seeing it for a while, now now he went to. Went up there in the summertime and, and found the locals who had lived there and started asking questions and became friends with them. And they took him up on the mountain and he started putting the pieces together. And, and that's how it happened. And he, you said in one in your story that there was snow located in like May and April, correct? Up on the top of the mountain. Oh, yes. Yes. They, they skied uh, in, in May uh, on a couple of years. Wow. Natural snow. Unbelievable. And this was back in the fifties, correct? This is back in the fifties. Yep. So, I mean, um, to break it down before you said that s- for some reason, bear pen would catch the, the snow on one side from the Lake effect snow. And then the other side, it would catch the, the coastal snow. So it was perfect. Yeah. It's gotten bombarded for both ways. <laughs> so and because and, it had the northeast exposure, it held the snow. Yeah. And plus it also had the, the amazing vertical drop that you were, you were talking about like 1900 feet, correct? Oh yes. yes. He was looking at 1900 vertical feet fall line straight down the mountain. He's looking at 1900 foot vertical. Now, um, next to that area is, was and well, all these were all working farms. They were all, uh, cows, milk mm-hmm. cows. Uh, uh, there's a farm next door. And one of my good friends to this day, his father and mother um, ran uh, a cow farm. And that that land, uh, if it had eventually been incorporated into the ski area, all the way down to the bottom was uh, 2,120 foot of vertical. Wow. And it and was, the Catskills. It was set up in such a fashion that the real estate plan for it would have been sensational. I mean, you could have had two two places right there where they would have uh, could have lodges and different parking lots, and that's just on that face. You can go over to uh, to the north of Bear Pen is a peak called Round Top, yep. and it has uh, an area called Johnson Hollow. Now, actually, just to put this into perspective, if anybody really looks into this deep. Hmm. On the west side of the mountain, where the the snow collectors are, there's a Johnson Hollow, and then on the bottom of Round Top, there's another Johnson Hollow, and it just yep. got named that way because of the locals. You know, everything around there is based. All the roads are yeah, are have people who used to live there. You know what I mean? And soon, you know, they've all passed on, but the the names of the roads continue. But over there, I mean, you had you you had a, another part, and then it would, that would continue over to a point at a town called Grand Gorge, which yep. is where Route uh, Route Thirty yep. comes into play, which is the road down the Platte Kill. Yeah, and Platte Kill got started because Doctor Lane 
um, got to know an architect that eventually, I mean, he had a, see, Dr. Lane wanted to do solar, solar collection because where he was, he couldn't get telephone poles up there to electricity at the yeah. top of the mountain. So he wanted to create a lodge that had solar collectors. But the trouble was that there was so much snow going on and the, the amount of sunny days was limited. So the solar wouldn't work. And the lodging that would have been associated to that, that would have been designed by the guy who eventually went on in 1959 and built Wow. which still exists to this day. Yeah. It's, it's crazy how, how it's all linked together. I, I mean, you, you're, you're telling so much stuff that it, it just all links up one after another. It's crazy. It certainly is. I mean, the first, the first, pl- the first place that I went to the, um, to write a story was the Simpsons. And, um, that was one of the reasons that led me again to bear pen outside of three or four people before that who had asked me if I knew about bear pen yet, but they, the rope toes that were on bear pen, actually the, the rope toe that, he, that Ben eventually built was the longest in the East at that time. And, um, the Simpsons went up to bear pen to splice, uh, splice rope for them for that lift. So through my conversation with Augustine uh, Simpson's son, I came to know the significance of that. And then eventually I just pursued it and, and the rest is history. Wow. Unbelievable. That's so crazy how everything intertwines. And that's all linked together. And, you know, I kind of, from my youth in, uh, in and around Syracuse, you had the same kind of thing going on. All those ski areas were kind of incorporated into each other. And now they're all owned by the same people. <laughs> and, and so and it, the, it's just kind of how it works. You know what I mean? So do you think these places kind of like work together or like one person kind of stole the idea from the other person? Well, I think it's kind of a free for all. I think they are kind of in competition, but they, they have, they're envious of each other too at the same time, you mm-hmm. know? Interesting. Very interesting. So, um, from the beginning into the end of, of, of bear, bear pen, not, not really that much, but how long did the building of the, the trails and everything else take? Well, they did it a little bit. See the, the top of bear pen, the top 100 of ver- vertical of bear pen, uh, you, you go from the summit to 36, 10 about this mm-hmm. conjecture as to exactly what it is because it's so flat. I mean, I've walked around up there on the top, and I can't figure out where the exact high point of that mountain is. It's Correct. fairly level. It's not a large area, but you, you really can't you really can't hone in on it. I mean, I've heard thirty six hundred, I thirty 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 six oh three four, thirty six ten, whatever. But there, the the whole thing at the top. Bear Pen has 100 feet of vertical at the top before it goes to like a leveler area. And that's where Dr. Lane built what he called the lodge level trail, which circles the whole top of the mountain. Okay. At lodge level was where he put the lodge. Okay. And next to the lodge, there was a bear wallow, which they had, he had uh, the workers come in with their bulldozers and stuff and expand that to an olympic size hockey rink so that people who came up who didn't ski or uh, came with friends that did ski they'd have something to do during the day yeah. so they could go out on this and ski or go out and ice skate and then go into the lodge where there was a, a round hearth with fireplace and they had food and and off to one side there was a generator to create electricity and um, and they just kind of moseyed on along. But to get up to that point, Dr. Lane took an existing road that went from Route 2, Green County Route 2, up the side of the mountain, and it, it went uh, to a cull between the Bear Pen Range and, and uh, Round Top, and then went back down through to the other side, where eventually... Uh, and the, he had uh, a parking lot intended on that side, so people who were coming up from Route 28, they could come up to that point, 
and he had these army trucks that people would be loaded into with their skis, and then it would be brought up to the top of the mountain. So you called, had them coming from both sides. Was that that was called Ski Run Road, correct? Ski Run Road, yes, yes. It became known as Ski Run Road. At the time of the operation, it wasn't called that. It was okay. called the Prattsville Vega Road. Oh, but yeah. once it got to the call, then Dr. Lane created a road uh, along the top ridge to get over to the lodge. It's something that you have to really kind of go there to realize, okay? But it was the only way, because he didn't own the bottom of the mountain, to, to get what was going. And then plus, uh, below 3,000 feet in the Catskills, your thaw rate is a little quicker because mm -hmm. of, of different conditions. So the top of the mountain, the snow effect of the blowing over the snow, it, from 3,000 feet, it doesn't really do too much. You're under just what normally would fall from coastal or regular storms, okay? So, in a way, the building of the 600 vertical at the very top was conducive to the, the amount of snow that you'd happen. You could get on the bottom of the rope toe at 3,000 feet and ride it up to the top, okay? Wow. And, you know, this, remember, this is snowmaking at that time was like they were just sprinklers, yeah. The, these guys were playing around with on Mohawk Mountain, and a, a real system wasn't created until uh, Grossinger's, I think, in 56. Mm -hmm. So Bear Pen had already been started by that time. But the whole thing of this was that he didn't own that bottom of that mountain. So this is the only way to go. Eventually, yeah. it would have happened. I think, you know, yeah. Eventually, it would have happened. So let's uh, let's go over quickly um after it was all, all built and they they did it everything let's go over quickly the features of bear pen uh vertical drop i remember you talking about 1900 feet correct yeah if you could at the end of the day they opened up the skiing everybody would gather together and they would ski down to the bottom of the mountain see where the snow jitneys the the uh, army trailers they would leave from Ski Run Road, which is up at the top of a, a, a ridge. And from that ridge, you go down into the little Westville Valley, and that's where the bottom of the skiing would take place. So during the day, you were skiing the top 600 feet. And at the end of the day, everybody would, who wanted to would gather together, and they would all go down together to the bottom of the 1,900-foot vertical. Whereas then there would be a truck that would come and they would pick them up and then bring them up the road to the top of where Ski Run Road is. Crazy, 1,900 feet. So Again, you kind of have to be there to see what's going on here, but I, I'm kind of simplifying it in a way. Uh -huh.